好的，欢迎各位回到微信大课。现在是下午七点零七分。接下来为各位带来的是 Working Shopping Navigator Interpreter Ability for Small Business 小型博物馆的全部操作的后设资料工作法。Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see. I believe that everyone can see my slides, and I'm looking forward to talking to you today. My name is Amanda Figueroa, and I'm here with Durationist.org to talk about what metadata and reliability for small business. I'm going to dig in all of that in a second, but I first. Excuse me, <laughs> but I first want to thank the Wikimedia organizers,、um, especially technical support, who have been so helpful to me.、Um, since unfortunately I can't be on site to deliver this presentation, so really, really big thank you to everyone on the tech team and the organizers in general. So let's get started. <laughs> Like I said, my name is Amanda Figueroa. I'm the platform director of a project called Creationist.、Um, we do a lot of things,、um, but perhaps most significantly,、um, we're interested in critical thinking about curatorial work around metadata and more.、Um, I call this the curation and push to curationist pipeline. <laughs> and to tell you, I really have to be able to tell you the history of the platform. So, what Curationist is is a、um, search aggregator. We bring together open source, open licensed、uh, cultural heritage art images from large scale museums all around the world into one searchable database.、Um, previously, if you wanted to find, let's say, artifacts related to indigenous Canadian、um, cultural heritage. You would have to go search a series of individual institutions to find those materials in their collections.、Um, now, at our platform at curationist.org, you can search over four million different object records all in one place. That's a really big project. <laughs> We have the most amazing、uh, development team put together this platform and undertook the work to not just accession in all of these. Art images, but also do the work to normalize metadata that makes them all searchable in one place. So there's a huge amount of metadata normalization that happens on our platform、uh, through our platform.、Um, that's the real technical achievement sort of at the heart of curation. But once we figured out that metadata normalization, we realized that actually we had a huge opportunity to not simply Normalize metadata that belongs to these、uh, cultural art records, but also to augment and append additional information to that metadata when it's in our. So we work with、um, an amazing team of digital archivists, metadata experts,、um, academics, fellows, critics, to review and update a lot of these metadata records.、Um, we're really I call this. Thinking about metadata work、uh, because we really are able to do a really radical grassroots level、um, decolonizing of metadata.、Uh, so I'm going to show you some examples of how we work with metadata that exists in our system, and then I want to talk to you about a couple new technological developments we're in the middle of thinking about、um, and about a pilot program that's going to be starting this year.、Um, To keep doing this work, but also to,、um, to continue supporting、uh, the museums and cultural heritage groups that make these objects. So I'm going to begin by talking to you about this item, which is called、um, in its original record, "Are Made by Day." This appears in our collection, and it comes to us from the National Museum of American History. This here is the original metadata record、um, that comes from that museum. So here's a photo of the 
by Dave. You can see that's the title. The agent or creator is Dave. Date information, 1862, as well as some information in South Carolina and Relatedly, we do some appears here subject records. Um, contextualizes this a little bit, um, as well as material technique, etc. Um, this is fine. This is a pretty good metadata record. Um, there's a lot of information there. Um, but when it came into our collections, one of our digital archivists um, saw this and wanted to take a closer look at it. So she actually dug into a lot of historical records and was able to append a lot of information to it. So when I come here to the next slide, you are seeing the updated metadata record um, created by our archivist Amanda Acosta, who is an absolute superstar. Everything you see here in yellow is original metadata that Amanda added to it. Um, so perhaps most significantly, at the end of her research, she said, I think we need a different title for this object. Um, and she wanted to call it, I made the star olive crop. I'll tell you why. Um, she was able to find a more complete name for the agent, again, or creator. Um, instead of just listing him as Dave, she was able to determine that his name was David Drake. He um, was a potter or a turner, um, so we added that to his role. Um, we also added a little more contextualizing information here about um, the date, flagging it with 19th century, antebellum south, um, as well as a little more detail to the location record and material. Um, it was important to add the context of African Americans um, to this record because as you can see here in the original one, although Dave, David Drake is a black man who was enslaved at the time that this object was made. Um, in the original record, he's only, um, uh, his, I, him being an African American is only referenced through the word slavery, um, whereas here it's referenced under African Americans, which adds a little more humanity um, and provides context to the cultural production of African Americans in this country within and without the umbrella of slavery. Um, relatedly, very, very important is um, the addition of two more subject tags here, uh, one of which is poetry. Um, and this is something that just makes this one of my favorite records in our whole database because I find it so moving that when Amanda looked at this record, you can see here written around the lip of the jar, David Drake was a poet. He was writing poetry in his ceramics. And that title, I Made This Jar Olive Cross, is the first line of the poem that's actually inscribed here. Um, and so when we add this subject label poetry, suddenly we're seeing this object as so much more than just a single object. We're seeing the full creative scope and the full creative agency of David Drake. So just by adding those new metadata tags, not only are we, of course, making this object more searchable, easy, easier to find, surfaced more in a huge database of cultural ob objects. Um, we're also really identifying the creative agency, the creative practice that made this work unique and makes David Drake unique as a potter. Um, so you can see that that's, that's a huge difference already to make, and it's only through the simple addition of metadata here. Um, if we continue moving on, I'm going to show you this record, which also was updated, but in a slightly different way. Um, this is an artwork that comes to us from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It's a, a painting done by Minor Kilborn Kellogg in the 1860s. Um, as you can see here, that is, in fact, the Oriental Princess. Um, and we've got subject tags um, for this record that include figure group, figure female nude, ethnicity, amusements, grooming, figure female, recreation, domestic, nudity, etc. There is, of course, I'll note, a much fuller metadata record for this object as well. Um, but I really want to prioritize showing you guys these subject tags. Again, we had some digital archivists take a look at this. Um, and most in particularly, Sharon Mizota, who is one of our metadata specialists, um, and again, an absolute superstar, uh, took a look at this and thought, I think we can do more. Um, so what she proposed, and you can see here, um, is this record. So not only have we maintained all of those original subject records, 
Sharon also advocated for us to add exoticism in art, voyeurism in art, and male gaze. And even further, she wrote this description, um, which is itself a metadata field, um, in which she highlights why adding these last three tags is so important. She wrote, the language used to describe people of Asian and Middle Eastern descent in the title of this work is outdated and offensive, and the way in which women are depicted is objectifying and dehumanizing. While these views may have been accepted at the time of the image's creation, the reductive worldview they represent was harmful then and is harmful now. For more information on why this image is problematic, please see Wikipedia entries, Orientalism, and Male Gaze. I love this. Um, this is hugely important. This is, this is a, a use of metadata that I don't think we see often. But what, what Sharon has done through adding these tags for us and, and this description record is not only, again, has this become more searchable, more findable by the inclusion of additional metadata tags, it's also brought into the 21st century. Now, not only are we seeing all this metadata that describes the image that the, um, that the painter was making in the 1860s, we also have context now for how we know it's going to be viewed in 2023 and onward. So what's the point of decolonizing metadata in this way. Um, there are many, many things that could be said about this, and I do want to be clear. Um, a big part of what we believe at Curationists is that decolonization is not a metaphor and, and should go all the way up to the up to and include the, the repatriation of, of indigenous cultural heritage artifacts. But when it comes to metadata, what does it do? Well, first of all, it adds vital information to the record of artworks and artifacts that was not always pre preserved during colonization. Again, we see a lot of that here in Jar Made by Dave. A lot of information in this original record was not preserved and it took our archivist to come in and unlock. Second of all, it raises indigenous knowledge about the creation, use, and context of the object or the artwork to position of parity with institutions. Again, we are able to identify here that David Drake was a poet um, and that he deserves credit for his poetry writing as much as he does for his role as a potter or a turner. And lastly, decolonizing metadata brings historic objects into a contemporary context, making them more searchable and therefore more accessible to the world. And we see that here again in Sharon's description and her um, very, very clear uh, context to the title and the, the image by Minor Kellogg. I care so much about this work. <laughs> it's been a real joy to get to do this through Curationist. Um, but the truth is that with over 4 million objects in our database, not every object can get this level of attention in its metadata. Um, that's, it's, I, know, I know there's no way we can do it because I know there's no way that the Smithsonian can do it. There's no way that these huge scale institutions all around the world have been able to take this fine tooth comb to everything in their collections. So we at Curationist are beginning to explore some technological ways that we can improve our collections and continue doing this work in metadata. So I'll tell you about three things we're working on, um, four things that, we're <laughs> that, uh, that we know we need to implement it well, um, and then I'll, I would love to open it up to Q&A or just discussion more broadly. Um, First of all, what we're working on is natural language processing as a tool to form stronger links between metadata terms. Um, one big way we're working on that now is through our search feature. Um, a great example of this is if you go to Curationist right now and type in um, indigenous Canadian cultural heritage pottery, let's say, indigenous Canadian pottery, you'll find everything in our database that is tagged indigenous and Canadian and pottery, uh, but what you may not find are things that are tagged only with Inuit, for example. Um, so we're implementing some natural language processing um, based on our metadata schema um, <clears throat> to form links between terms like this and ensure that what you type in and what you receive are the same, even if some of the metadata terms are a little bit different. Um, we're also working on 
finding ways to support digitization and licensing efforts in small museums. Right now we have 14 institutional partners. They are amazing to work with. We are so lucky, um, but they are all large scale, extremely well-funded um, wor uh, world, world scope institutions. And what that means is that all of our collections come from these very large museums. What we'd love to do is ensure that small museums who don't necessarily have the in-house capacity for uh, the technology it takes to digitize, um, the licensing knowledge it takes to digitize, the web hosting and other technological capacity to digitize and open license their collections. Um, and finally, we're interested in exploring Wikidata as a metadata schema um, internally. Uh, right now, we run off of a slightly modified version of Dublin Core metadata, um, and that's worked pretty good for normalizing across all of these different institutions. But we're in the middle of um, examining how feasible it is, perhaps, to use Wikidata as our internal metadata schema, which would allow us, of course, to quickly push out a lot of additional information to places like Wikidata, Wikicommons, and, um, and other open source aggregators in that way. So to do all three of those things well, um, there are many things that we need. I'll flag the top four that have really been on my mind. Uh, the first is multi-language support. Um, uh, we are beginning to uh, put together a pilot program um, to implement these three things. Um, and one of the most important parts of that is ensuring that this pilot program is multilingual from the beginning. Um, we're exploring what languages those might be. Um, I personally am a, am a fluent Spanish speaker, so it might be Spanish. Um, but certainly building in that functionality from the ground up and from day one is important, especially if our goal is continuing to support small museums and not necessarily these global facing institutions. We're also really focused on our need to understand obstacles that are unique to small institutions. I talked a little bit before about staff capacity, um, internal knowledge around metadata, digitization, licensing, et cetera. Um, I'm still in the middle of doing a lot of research uh, talking to small institutions, um, registrars, collections managers, and understanding specifically what's unique to them that they need a solution for. Um, that's the problem that we're interested in solving. Um, because of course we believe that when we support small institutions, it makes it easier for institutions of any level to, um, to get involved. Uh, third, of course, we're very focused on interoperability standards of practice for metadata. Uh, sometimes that means researching um, the best standards of practice in metadata, and sometimes that means coming up with our own and, um, and really doing our best to talk to broader communities to get everyone on the same standard. Uh, I often talk about that as just uh, good citizenship in the, in the open knowledge community. Um, we're interested in helping everyone learn how to do this, not necessarily only in growing the curationist platform or growing our collections. And of course, to do that, we need stakeholder feedback in all areas, which is what brought me to Wikidata virtually uh, today. Um, we are, like I mentioned, in the middle of putting together a pilot program that's going to explore a lot of these questions, a lot of these issues, a lot of these new features. Um, so if you've seen something here today that you are interested in, or if you have seen something today that you have uh, have experience in or have a have a really strong take on, um, I would really, really love to have a conversation with you. Please, please, please be in touch. Um, if anything jumps out to you, please go ahead and shoot me an email at curationist at mhcfoundation.org. I'd be happy to have a conversation and let you know how you can get further involved in our pending pilot program. Thanks so much for your time today, guys. This was really amazing. Um, I'll leave it there, and if there's questions, maybe they can be in the chat. Oh, and uh, again, thank you to the, the technical team for helping me solve that echo problem early on.